Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our webcast, Selling on Amazon, the Inside Story. Uh, my name is Rob Lunder from the Edge by Essential Marketing Department, and we're very excited to be joined today by a tremendous panel of speakers, including Whitney Gibson with Voorhees, Denise Hampton with Zebra Technologies, and Robin Gable with Yogi T. All participants today are on mute for the call, but if you have any questions, you can ask them by entering them into the Q&A box we will, uh, on the right-hand side of your screen. We will make sure to do our best to answer your questions today. And if we are unable to do so due to time constraints, uh, we'll make sure to follow up with you after the webca webcast and respond to you directly. Today's webcast is brought to you today by Edge by Essential, uh, formerly Brandview, Clavis Insight, One Click Retail, and Planet Retail RNG. Our four companies have joined forces under Essential PLC with a shared vision to empower brands and retailers with the most comprehensive, accurate, and actionable insights and advisory solutions to grow revenue in an e-commerce driven marketplace. Uh, we partner globally, globally with the world's leading brands and retailers to identify strategies and to provide weekly, daily, and real-time digital shelf performance KPIs, including pricing, promotions, availability, traffic, conversion, sales, and share. Additionally, today's session is also brought to you by Yogi T, headquartered in Springfield, Oregon. A leading, uh, Yogi T is a leading international manufacturer of organic wellness tea products. Today's session is also brought to you by Zebra Technologies uh, with North American headquarters in Lincolnshire, Illinois. Zebra is a pioneer at the edge of the enterprise. Their products, software, services, analytics, and solutions are used to intelligently connect your people, assets, and data. And last but not least, today's webcast is also brought to you by Voris, Sater, Seymour, and Pease, who provides business and legal counsel to clients throughout the United States and around the world. I'd like to very quickly introduce today's speakers before we get started. Uh, Whitney Gibson. Uh, is a partner at Voorhees, Sater, Seymour & Pease, uh, a leader in a, uh, an AM200 firm and leader of the firm's nationally recognized e-control group. He and the firm's team have developed cutting-edge yet cost-effective solutions to help brands control their sales in the digital age. Whitney also is chair of the firm's technology and intellectual property group. In leading Voorhees e-control, Whitney has developed custom programs for companies confronting unauthorized sales, gray market sales, counterfeit sales, minimum advertised price violators, and other illegal sales on the internet. The team combines legal, technological, and investigative tools and services. Also on the line today is Denise Hampton. Denise is the Senior Director uh, for global, grant, global Brand Content and Campaign Strategy at Zebra Technologies. During her 23-year tenure with the company, she has been working with its channel partners in a variety of marketing and sales strategy roles, ranging from marketing communications, vertical practice leadership, sales operations, and channel operations. She led the implementation of strategies to better manage the company's brand on online marketplaces, and in her current role is developing strategies to strengthen the company's brand through holistic portfolio marketing strategies implemented to and through the channel ecosystem. And also on today's call is Robin Gable. Robin, Robin is a national account manager at Yogi Tea, uh, again, a leading international manufacturer of organic wellness tea products. Robin's role is, an, as, is as an omni-channel sales and strategy lead, developing and executing plans that accelerate growth and customer retention while preserving profitability and brand value. On a mission to remain at the forefront of the evolution of retail and e-commerce, Robin is focused on understanding and meeting industry changes. Her unique perspective has been shaped over a decade as a CPG brand marketing and business strategy professional with knowledge and practice in branding, integrated multi-channel marketing, product innovation, consumer affairs, team leadership, and channel strategy. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Whitney, who will start us off with today's presentation. Uh, Whitney, over to you. Uh, Whitney, can you hear us okay? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you great. Okay, yeah, I think I think you or, uh, you, you had me on mute. Um, okay. So um, no, thank you all very much for joining. Uh, yes, my name is Whitney Gibson. I lead the e-control group here at Voris, and um, I'm excited to to have this webinar, and thank you all for attending. I, I think this is this is a very timely webinar. Uh, as many of you have probably read or heard about, uh, there's been lots of changes with Amazon uh, just recently. Uh, I think people have been, 
you know, n- known for a while that Amazon has been building up in, and leading up to this one vendor system uh, and what they're saying of merging 1P and 3P. And last week, I was actually out at Shop Talk when uh, it was announced, uh, it was reported about a thousand brands all of a sudden uh, reported they were not getting purchase orders from 1P Amazon anymore. And so it quickly became the, uh, the talk of, uh, of the conference. Um, lots of speculation going on, lots of writing uh, that's been out there. Um, you know, I, I have heard from a, a very reliable source that, that you know, long term it is Amazon's uh, plan to, to shift a lot of what they deem tier two and tier three brands over to um, the third party uh, marketplace or ask people to essentially sell, sell themselves on the, on the third party or, or through a, you know, an exclusive third party seller. Um, and then they will have certain what they call select one tier brands that, uh, that they'll, they'll want to sell one P. So, um, you know, that's going on just, I think it was just a couple of days ago, you know, another interesting news related to the brands. They, they announced that they were going to remove a provision in their contract where they required brands to offer the lowest price on Amazon versus other channels um, and versus what they were selling on their own website. Now, um, you know, on that issue, just I, what I've heard and seen on that is that they are going to potentially remove that out of the contract. Uh, but, it still doesn't take away their ability to suppress the buy box or give back uh, price concessions if if brands don't have good control over their sales and, and and advertising pricing on the other channels. So, you know, in my opinion, that that change probably for brands is a little bit more form over substance right now. But but we'll see how it plays out. But in any event, I think you know related to this this topic here today. Um, you know, as brands are, I think, seeing lots of people shifting to 2P and 3P, and, and brands have been discussing hybrid approaches for a while now, they've really been, I'm seeing a lot of brands that had initially got on to Amazon selling as 1P or having their distributors or retailers really start to think about the 3P approach. And so I'm excited uh, that we have Robin Gable and Denise Hampton. These are two two executives that I've worked with um, and and have seen them uh, really be thought leaders within their organizations and do deep dives um, on what is the best strategy for their overall organization. So I think they'll be able to share a lot of insights on that. Um, but, you know, no matter what happens, whether you're 1P, 3P, um, you know, what we see here at Voris is that one of the, the key foundational pillars for, for brands to be able to succeed in the age of Amazon and in the rapidly growing marketplace world is this issue of having control. And the brands that are able to control who's selling their products, you know, the, the advertised price compliant, um, the channels of which they're selling are able to maintain the profitability. They're able to run the advertising they want. They're able to achieve the review scores that they want. They're able to grow and achieve kind of what a lot of times we talk about the three pillars of long-term brand health, revenue, and profitability. Um, and so Vori's here, we work with over 300 manufacturers now and, and have gained a lot of insights in, in helping brands gain control and seeing, seeing what works, what doesn't, and, and what at the end of the day, you know, benefits the brands achieve by, by doing that. So I'm going to dive into some of the fundamentals. And I think one of the things that's helpful for a lot of brands just to think about is why why do you have to exert change today? Why why do you actually have to go out and do things to gain additional control? And and, and the reality was that prior to the rise of the marketplaces in, in Amazon, typically if somebody sold to a distributor and they sold to a reseller and that reseller wanted to divert to New York or they wanted to drop below a manufacturer's suggested price in New York. That didn't impact what happened in LA. Um, it certainly didn't impact what happened in Europe. And it really did not have that big of a damage uh, or impact on a business. So the level of controls that brands exerted um, were relatively low because it, it didn't have a ripple effect across their entire business. Um, but what happens is, is the world has drastically changed. And now Amazon uh, essentially, as I describe kind of a visual, it sits as a, a sign that sits on top of the world where uh, people are constantly looking at it and what how your brand is represented there, 
the prices at which your products are being advertised, the reviews that are being leveled against the brand, all of that becomes a really, really big impact for the brand. And you know, where we sit today, I mean, this is just the beginning of the wave. And so brands, the world has drastically changed for them and their, their old world of control um, is leading to lots of problems because, you know, and a lot of times I'll say to people, like, think about it like, you know, if you're in a hot climate, you have a T-shirt on, all of a sudden it gets freezing cold and you, you need to put on, uh, you know, a much, a, a much warmer clothes to survive. Well, a lot of the brands are still sitting there in the T-shirt and what's happening is in their old world of controls, um, they are seeing lots of issues on these third-party marketplaces that are drastically hurting their brand. And primarily it's caused by lots of different people selling their products on these marketplaces. Often third-party sellers, people getting the hold of their products through promotions, through um, discounts, through arbitrage, through returns, people that are buying from their distributors and turning around and dumping excess inventory. All sorts of different people know that if they can get a hold of brands' products for cheap, they can turn around and sell them on the on the marketplaces at a discounted at a discounted rate uh, where the traffic exists, and that in turn causes lots of problems for the brands, lots of different pain points. Um, and you know, I think this slide does a pretty good job of kind of summarizing what those are. But a lot of things, just to set the framework here, is that you know we live in this world right now where I see a lot of brands' old method of controls kind of matched up with this new age of third-party marketplaces. And and and, all, and as a result, what you see is brands with these people selling their products for cheap on Amazon, massive channel conflict. I mean, retailers are getting more and more aggressive about refusing to carry products of brands that don't have good control over the, the products and the price they're being advertised on Amazon. I see retailers aggressively negotiating um, discounts with the manufacturers. Uh, and so a lot of manufacturers are seeing their margin erode in their brick and mortar channels. I see e-commerce teams very frustrated. They don't have control. They they have advertising that they want to be able to run, but they only get able to run it when they're in the buy box. And so what happens is when these third-party sellers swoop in, they, they can't have control of their advertising, and it, and it stunts a lot of their growth. A lot of them are trying to still sell to Amazon, but Amazon's coming back and asking for price concessions and negotiating lower prices, uh, eroding their margins uh, with Amazon. Um, you know, you're seeing things like negative reviews and just upset customers and overall damage to the brand. And so brands um, in this situation right now, we're seeing people that are losing. We're seeing people that are failing to ad adopt, uh, failing to evolve, and they're getting very frustrated. Um, we have people that have had you know, large contracts canceled by Walmart and Target and other major retailers. Um, people were threatened four and five hundred million dollar a year contracts canceled by those folks. You have people that we see uh, are are growing ne nowhere near their their competitors because they have such frustration of their distributors and brick and mortar mom and pop resellers buying from them, coming and dumping products on there, um, interfering with their with their e commerce growth strategy. You know, and then there's people that we're seeing win right now. We're seeing people that are able to get control. They're able to, on top of that, throw really good SEO, really good conversion, really good advertising, um, really good programs to control their reviews. And they throw that on top and they're growing at rates as much as 80, 90 percent a year on Amazon. The, the, you know, companies that are able to get control and then be able to do best in class growth and conversion tactics on top of it. Um, and so, you know, the reality is I think a lot of companies have to realize is that you have to you have to typically evolve. You may be sitting in an organization that is is practices were set up for the old environment and have not evolved. Um, and so there is change that has to occur uh, for brands to to be able to achieve uh, these key key components in, in this age of e-commerce. And um you know, that, that's just the reality. So the question is, what are some of the fundamental things that, that we've seen brands do that are really able to, uh, to gain control of their sales online and kind of thrive in this, in this omni-channel environment? So just to kind of overview, I think what a lot of people started off with and thinking about control is they got sold from technology companies saying, look, you know, we, 
we have a map monitoring program and you put in a map policy and all your problems are going to go away. Or they would go to their lawyer and our lawyer would say, you know, I know a lawyer who writes map policies and he says, if I put a map policy in, I can get my problems fixed. Or maybe I'll hire McKinsey and they'll come in and they'll give me consulting on distribution strategies in the e-commerce environment. The reality is, is that to gain control uh, in a way, and in our mission, we typically describe it is to help businesses control sales in the age of e-commerce to drive business value. And, and you have to think about how are we going to control this in the way that maximizes our business value? And the reality is there's many different buttons you can push. There's, there's legal buttons. There's technology investigation buttons. There's business changes that you can make, right? And... There, there's all these different things, but a lot of people will run out, and I think they'll run out, and they'll just try one thing. They may say, oh, I'm going to try to find the leaks, or I'm going to do a map policy. And one of those common things I see people is run out, throw a map policy, try to do it with their authorized retailers, and then everyone ends up pointing back at the unauthorized and gray market sellers that exist all over the marketplaces. And they say, you want me to comply with map? Well, you have all these anonymous people selling the products on the marketplaces. How am I going to comply with MAP? And then the manufacturer ends up in this really kind of hard situation because it's it's really not fair for them to enforce it, but do they want to retract it? And the reality is, is what companies need, and this is the category that that I think is really important for companies to think about this, is an integrated e-control solution that combines each of the components that work best for them. They need a, And they need to be able to find those levers and be able to push those levers that work for them based on their goals their market share, the country they're trying to operate in, um, and, and other fact-specific circumstances. So you really need to look at the legal, you need to look at the business, and you need to look at the technology, and you need to kind of put together a solution. And that's why, you know, a lot of times we'll describe Boris as comprehensive e-control because we bring together kind of the business, the law, the technology investigations. So, so how do we do that? So what one of the most common things, and this I'll give you an example of just a typical problem that we'll see companies have and kind of an integrated strategy uh, that that we'll often see companies employ. So company comes in and they say, look, I tried a map policy. My authorized sellers are pointing. My marketplace is still a mess. I have all these unauthorized sellers that are interfering with my sales or eroding my margin. They're causing channel conflict. I'll say, okay. Now, what you need to typically do to solve that brand is to get from the left-hand side here to the right-hand side. And you need to get from an environment where you have people selling at all different random prices to a situation where you got 99% of your sales going out the door at the price you want by the authorized seller. So you don't need to get typically get rid of every single seller on the marketplace. But if you can get to the point where 95 98 99% of the sales are going out the door through your authorized seller, they're going out the door at the price you want, um, then typically your director of e-commerce is happy, the VP of sales through your brick and mortar channels is happy, um, your executives are happy. It, it solves the pain point. So the question is, how do you get there? And this is the kind of approach that, that I was talking about, where it's not there's not a it, there's not just do a map policy or just look at your distribution. There's usually a number of key steps that you have to put in place in order to be able to get there. The first is you got to think hard about your distribution strategy. Uh, on the marketplaces. Um, you know, I think most of the companies have evolved enough um, to realize that just a allowing a bunch of your brick and mortar distributors or your brick and mortar resellers to go sell on the marketplaces is not a good idea. Um, you know, I tell brands a lot of times, I say, look, I'm going to try to you know, have a map policy and we're going to allow 20 of our brick and mortar sellers to sell in there, but I think I can get them to comply with map. And I tell people that, you know, that's like, that's like me leaving my kids alone with iPad and candy and saying, don't touch either of them. Like it doesn't work. And, and the same type of thing where people have a bunch of their authorized sellers all staring at the buy box, often anonymous to try to get a compliance with a pricing policy just doesn't work. And, you know, the other example I often will use in, with brands is, and our antitrust attorneys when working with brands uh, would often help them, you know, avoid a situation where, let's say a car dealership or car manufacturer, they would never want 30 car dealers on the same street. And the reason is, is because what's going to happen is they're all going to lose motivation to advertise. They're going to lose motivation to go out and try to increase demand. And instead, they're just going to wait for the traffic to come by. And then they're going to drop, drop price to try to get the traffic against the other dealers. And then if you have a competitor across the street, though, that only has one dealer, 
And they're going to convince everybody in town to buy that brand because they know if they can convince them that, then they get the sale. And this is what I see on Amazon a lot is the brands that have uh, control, have a, a motivated seller, whether it be an exclusive third party or Amazon or themselves, and they're able to get 98, 98% of the sales. Now they're highly motivated. They've got the margin that they can invest. They can run the advertising in the buy box. They can apply all the growth tactics. And I see them grow much faster than brands that just have a bunch of people sitting there all staring at the buy box. And so I think it's important to, for most brands to look at, you know, trying to get that into that situation where you've got one seller that that's motivated or one, one path that's motivated on these marketplaces. Um, then there's obviously a lot of analysis that goes into whether you want to go 1P, 3P, or hybrid. And, and you know, we could do a whole, a whole webinar just on that. Um, you know, and I've seen, I've seen a lot of brands more and more recently going, you know, with down a path where they're picking an exclusive third party seller that specializes in selling on Amazon and having them buy the products and sell, grow it. And, and it's somebody that they trust will comply with map. Um, you know, but there's also a lot of brands that, that still sell 1P as well. So, um, but you, you pick your strategy on how you want to do it. Then you have got to put in controls with your authorized sellers. You've got to change from the environment where you sold to distributors and they sold to resellers. And there was no sort of control with those resellers buying from the distributors. And typically the way people are doing that in a way that doesn't disrupt the business is realistic, but, but it still works is typically through policy, not by going out and having all the distributors sign a contract or asking them to, you know, have everybody they sell to sign contracts. Often it's through a policy that we often term an authorized reseller policy. We'll send out the distributors, they will provide the resellers and the, and the, the key components of it will typically say to your resellers, look, you can sell on your own website, but you can't sell on the marketplaces. Um, once you do that, um, you know, before you roll out a, a map policy, you got to think about how are we going to be able to deal with these unauthorized sellers, all right? Because there's going to be what I call gray market, all those people that get your products through promotions or arbitrage. And if you go to them and say, look, we have a reseller policy, you can't sell on Amazon, or we have a map policy, they're going to say, I don't care. I bought your product. I'm allowed to resell it. There's nothing illegal about that. Um, and a lot of those folks, they're much more likely to drop price um, than even your resellers are. So it's really key that you think about how are you going to address those folks. Now, in the law here, I'm not going to go too much into the weeds, but basically those folks can buy your product and resell it unless they're selling a product that is materially different from the product being sold by the authorized sellers or is being sold outside of your quality controls. Now, material difference under the law in the U.S. does not have to be a physical difference. One difference is enough and the difference can be subtle. And th those are all uh, phrases that come out of, out of cases. And basically what the courts have held to be material differences can be things like does not come with the manufacturer's warranty, does not come with a satisfaction guarantee, does not come with a access to the loyalty program, does not come with access to customer service. Um, it can be physical differences as well. Um, but we have a list of like 50 different things. And honestly, what you have to do is you have to sit down with the business and, and you have to put up all the different things that services or benefits or things that they could provide with their products and find which one works for the brand. You put them up front of a whiteboard and you brainstorm. And we haven't had a brand yet where we couldn't come out with one or two things that they a service or benefit they could provide through their authorized channels that don't apply to the unauthorized. Um, but you just got to go through the work of, of doing that. You know, another way to do it is besides creating the difference is quality controls. And the other exception to the first sale doctrine besides the material difference is what we call the quality control exception. And that is if you have legitimate quality controls, you, you abide by them, um, and you can show that the sales by the unauthorized sellers either, you know, they're not following your quality controls or they're interfering with them or they're not subject to them, you can have claims against them. And it's presumption of consumer confusion under what's known as the, the Lanham Act. And so these marketplaces uh, are provide a strong foundation for companies to implement heightened quality controls. 
um, in the U.S., in Europe, and it's being recognized around the world that these marketplaces for brands pose serious quality control type problems. I mean, even the, even over in Europe where they, they, for a long time they were very strict about prohibiting brands from any, any sort of restrictions on who can sell online, they they recognize that brands can have restrictions over people who can sell in the marketplaces and put in criteria related to the quality controls that people can meet. And the reason for this is that, you know, brands, they don't have, often don't have privity of contract with the, the marketplace. They don't have control over the types of practices that that third party platform is, is doing. Um, the people that are selling on there, they're able to sell anonymously. The consumer can't look at it before they purchase. The people that sell have every incentive to drop uh, the, the the price of their product in order to get in the buy box and get the sale, which in turn often encourages them to skirt or minimize the quality control uh, quality controls or quality control processes in order to be able to sell with a cost low. So all that provides a foundation for often uh, what companies will do is implement heightened quality controls that apply to your sales in the marketplaces. Look, you know I've seen companies choose an exclusive third party seller and say. We want you to provide the data that you're getting from Amazon regarding your review scores. Uh, we want you to um, have in your warehouse a five-point check system. We want you to have uh, three years of experience of selling on Amazon with less than a 0.2% defect rate. Um, you know, build in all these conditions, all right? Um, and you can do things that your authorized sellers can meet. If you're selling to Amazon, you can build in criteria like, you know, we want to opt out of commingling, no selling anonymously, opt out of trans shipping. There's, there's all sorts of things that you can do um, that allow you, once you put those quality controls in place or you put in the service and benefits, you now have a foundation that you can go out and control with. And, I, and I'll talk about enforcement here in a second, but this foundation is, with my, if, if you find an authorized seller that's selling in a channel they're not supposed to, you can enforce your reseller policy. And if you have an unauthorized seller that's selling in a place they're not supposed to, then you have the material difference or the, the claim of the variance in quality controls that you can use uh, against them as your foundation. You then have to go out and enforce, right? And, you know, you, we call it 360 e-control because you have to put the right foundation in place, but you also have to be able to enforce because people, if, if they don't see you as enforcing, they're going to be constantly working to suck products out of your distribution. So how do you do that? Um, brand People have tried lots of games. You know, brand registry came out. People thought brand registry could help them. They found that they're not going to remove unauthorized sellers. They're going to not remove people just on the basis that they're violating your reseller policy or they're violating the Lanham Act. Um, people will try technology companies sending a bunch of C&D letters and they'll get some down, they'll get halfway up the hill, and then the, the people will understand that they're not really serious about enforcing, that they don't have a legal foundation, and the people just pop back up and you roll back down to the bottom of the hill. You know, people have tried to use technology companies to claim things to Amazon, like, you know, and people are doing it that aren't practicing law, and I've seen them get brands in trouble because they'll claim something's a counterfeit when it's not, or a trademark infringement when it's not. So the the, the best way to do it, honestly, is you have to go at the sellers themselves, and you have to use technology, investigation, and and enforcement going after the sellers. And so, how do you do it? You use technology to go out and find the sellers and prioritize who to go after. You use data and analytics to be able to do that. Uh, then you in-house investigation team will go out, will identify the sellers, uh, get their identity. Um, and once you have the identity of the sellers, um, then basically if it's an authorized seller, your business reach out with business incentives and disincentives and can you know, let them know if they keep selling in a place they're not supposed to, that you can cut them off or um, you know, you take other actions with respect to them. If they're a gray market or unauthorized seller, then typically it's through escalated enforcement. Often we'll send a C&D letter that'll have um, in detail all the cases explaining why they're selling a materially different product, why they're selling a product outside of our quality controls, and why they're liable under the Lanham Act uh, and other, other statutes. I mean, there's other claims you can usually have against these folks, but most of them don't collect taxes the way they should. So there's unfair competition claims. Um, many of them you can have tortious interference. So there's other claims that you can use, but 
C&D letters, hand deliver draft complaints to their home in a yellow envelope. So they're sit sitting at their kitchen counter and they get hand delivered a draft complaint. And we typically find that if you have the valid legal claims and you go through this process, you're able to hit, you know, that they know you, they know that you now know who they are, that they now know that you have a valid legal claim that you're going to do something about it. You've even gone to the point, you know, we'll have a template draft complaint we'll hand deliver to them. And we find that about 95% of them will come down and go away then. And, you know, we always have the option of going to escalated legal, but very seldom, you know, is that necessary. So, you know, typically we'll run through, you know, for a, for a situation like I just described to you, this is kind of the, an integrated strategy that we've seen work. And, you know, we'll only often recommend rolling out a map policy after you get the, the marketplaces cleaned up, um, getting rid of the unauthorized sellers, getting to the point where now you can go out and enforce a map policy uh, across your channels, which, which can often be important because, you know, if you're selling to Amazon or even if you're selling as a 3P, if you're selling a 3P, they'll, they'll suppress the buy box if you don't have good map compliance and, and your other key channel partners. So, you really want to clean up the unauthorized and then also go out and if pricing is important, look at look at some sort of pricing policies in your other channels. Now, there's a lot of brands where, you know, there may be you know, consumer product companies at lower price points where that's not necessary. Um, you just kind of kind of evaluate it based on your situation. So um, before I turn over to Denise and, and Robin, just real quick, a, a couple case studies here. Um, that have applied like this strategy where they come in, 53% of the products are going out the door at the price they want uh, on Amazon. And they, you know, had tried a map policy with their authorized and they found out that, you know, the authorized all kept pointing at the unauthorized gray market. And they said, you know, the map policy ended up uh, having to totally retract it because no one would comply with it. So analyze their distribution strategy chose one, one, one path of distribution on Amazon, put in policies with their authorized sellers, put in a satisfaction guarantee and heightened quality controls, and went out, used data investigation enforcement. Now 96% of the products going out the door on Amazon are at the price they want through their authorized sellers. And they're in a place where if you ask the VP of sales, director of e-commerce, executives, you know, they, they were able to get, get, get their Amazon channel in, in the place that they wanted it. Here's a headphone manufacturer, same thing. I and mean, they had almost 700 unauthorized sellers on the marketplaces or on Amazon alone. And 11% of the products are going out the door at the price they want. In September 18, they had 96%, same thing, policies with their authorized, put in place services and benefits and enforcement. Health supplement company, same thing. Um, you know, the also thing you'll see a lot of times is control leads to growth. So you see increase in sales. Month one, you know, they're getting 65% of the sales uh, on Amazon. Now, month six, they're getting 95% through the authorized channels. Just the units sold by the authorized sellers, 141% increase in seven months. Um, so, you know, we've seen a lot of companies go where they're growing from the Amazon average to far above the Amazon average. Uh, of brands just by getting getting the control they need. So, um, you know, I know people want to hear from hear from the brands, and so I think uh, you know I think this is a good point here where I will turn it over to Robin, and she can talk to you about Yogi T and, and and kind of the strategy that that they use. So, Robin, um, go ahead. Thank you, Whitney. Good morning, everyone. I'll take you through at a high level the Yogi T and evolution of how we've approached online sales. As Whitney mentioned, I mean, one of the biggest issues that we were encountering was with third party sellers on our online marketplaces and particularly with Amazon. Amazon accounted for the vast majority of our e commerce business, and doing business there was becoming increasingly costly and burdensome, not just on marketing or sales but across the organization with managing the logistics and financials associated with doing business directly with Amazon. As Amazon's third party uh, seller central business was growing, so were the number of problematic third party sellers listing our products on Amazon and other marketplaces. And this was creating downward pressure on price and it was making it difficult for our strategically important brick and mortar business partners to compete. There was also an utter lack of control over product listings and limited documented quality controls. 
This is eroding our sales, our profits, brand integrity, and really importantly, trust from our consumers. We knew there had to be a better way, so we thought to make some changes. The first step was educating ourselves and internal stakeholders in our organization to wrap our arms around what wasn't working and what was and how we could go about it in a better way. In my research with for strategic partners, I stumbled upon exactly what Whitney was describing, talking to a lot of technology providers to try to help disseminate the information and aggregate it in one place so we could get a better understanding for what was happening and where we could enact change. And thankfully, I was in, in, uh, connected to Whitney Gibson through, at Boris during this research. And together with Boris, we ended up engaging with them. We established a strategy and associated policies that now empower our business to protect our and grow our brand online profitably and reduce the channel conflict being caused by the price erosion issues that we were having. The first steps that we took, we thoughtfully crafted a set of foundational policies and quality controls. We distributed them directly to all retailer, distributor, and reseller partners. We wanted to educate them about what we were doing, the why, and how it benefited everyone. Benefited them by stopping the diversion of our products to unauthorized sellers that were eroding the brand. Second, we restricted sales on marketplaces and engaged in exclusive, trusted third-party sellers who specialized in selling on Amazon. This group adheres to the quality controls that we established and documented, supporting our product quality and integrity for our valued customers, building back and maintaining that brand trust. Next slide. Let's see. Okay, with Amazon accounting for the vast majority of our e-commerce business, but also a big portion of our third-party seller problem, we developed and executed a comprehensive Amazon distribution strategy, and that was key. We evaluated a number of different options, but ended up engaging with an exclusive third party that specialized in Amazon sales. And some of the benefits listed here really outline the value in this partnership. We were able to gain back control um, through a partner that was really seeking to add value and not just sell more volume, but had a vested interest in protecting our brand image ensuring brand integrity and consistency and making sure that representation of the product online was accurate. All of our listings were at mass, protecting our profit profitability. And this really enhanced the ability to work with our existing partners elsewhere, online and offline, to achieve MAP compliance. We instituted and documented quality controls that are being upheld. Um, and with that came monitoring technology, which supports our enforcement and MAP compliance efforts. And this really all reduced a tremendous amount of burden on our internal resources across the organization. Um, as anyone who's doing direct business with Amazon now, dozens of fulfillment centers to work with, the logistics associated with getting there and high costs, as well as chargebacks and other complications dealing with them were dramatically reduced. I'm not gonna go into a tremendous amount of detail here, but what this demonstrates is the workflow that we have established with Boris to really understand and define and separate authorized from unauthorized and to manage who is doing what and at what time in terms of communication to support our existing business, but to reduce the unauthorized listings negatively impacting our business. Okay, we'll talk about some results to date. What we've seen, Unauthorized product listings are down over 60%, and the volume that we command as a manufacturer through our exclusive seller now exceeds 95% of our total Amazon sales, and previously that figure was dramatically lower. Our average daily listings below MAP are down 91%. So now we have, next slide, of tremendous MAP compliance of over 99%. And that's up from about 10 months ago when we engaged with Boris and began enforcement efforts of 67% MAP compliance. Okay. As far as what's next for our business, we always have, we'll have ongoing enforcement across marketplaces and websites to maintain listing quality, MAP compliance but we're finally able to go on offense. We're shifting our focus from managing day-to-day -day logistics associated with get closing down third-party sellers, and we're able to really look at driving profitable growth online on Amazon and beyond, as well as looking at international opportunities for kind of regaining that control as well beyond the United States. 
uh, some of our key learnings to share. We're able to monitor math and content health, but that wasn't enough. As Whitney mentioned, really producing a comprehensive strategy with a reseller, retailer, distributor policies, and then being able to go actually out and enforce. We have seen that cycle of unauthorized resellers come back after taking a brief hiatus from selling our product to see if we're taking this seriously. And we are, and now we're seeing the benefits to enacting those policies and quality controls and really regaining that control over how our product is represented online and the benefits associated with doing that. This comprehensive approach really was helpful to our business and now we're in the growth phase. This required a lot of education and executive sponsorship internally to get done. Denise will speak about this in more detail about how she managed that through her organization, but it's an ongoing process. And we're always having continuous dialogue with our external partners and internally monitoring the dynamic landscape. As Whitney mentioned, Amazon is continuously making changes to their policies and how they're seeking to do business with businesses of various sizes, um, either directly or indirectly with their platform. So, but really our focus on Amazon was a, was a key portion of the business. And then once we were able to get Amazon cleaned up and in a position where we had some semblance of control, we're able to go out and do better business everywhere else with reduced channel conflict. And with that, I'll turn it over to Denise. Yeah, Denise, uh, real quick, just I just wanted to add on, on Robin. I think one of the things that's neat here, you know, is as Robin dove into this, um, letting the business define the metrics that you're going at. I, I think, I often think a lot of the market, frankly, is misled by companies or people are just trying to sell some sort of monitoring service or things like that and say, oh, look, we re look how many sellers we removed this month. Look how many sellers we removed that month. Um, without or look at we reduce the the number of listings and when the when you talk to the business though they want to solve channel conflict they want their authorized seller to be able to get 99 percent of the sales they want the products going out the door at the price they want and and, and so you know this is why when you look here i think it's so important you know for for a company like yogi is that you know, when they get to this point, 99% of the products going out the door the price they want, then when they're talking with retail partners and if someone says, well, I see a onesie twosie on here that's selling a low price, they can, they can always say, well, look, 99% of the products are going out the door at the same price we're asking you to sell, so it reduces the channel conflict, and they're able to support their e-commerce strategy. So I would just encourage businesses to really think about your business problem and what, what KPI is going to solve it as opposed to just jumping on some metrics that a technology provider is trying to trying to show you. So Denise, I'll turn it over to you. Go ahead. Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, before I get into the, the meat of my uh, section of this presentation today, what I'm going to do is just give everybody a little bit of background, um, not necessarily on what Zebra sells, but um, how we've gone to market in the past. And I think it's instructive because it's very much in contrast with more of the, the B2C companies like Yogi and others that dominate uh, Amazon and uh, other marketplaces uh, that are out there as options. So we, we are a B2B tech company. Uh, we sell through technology channels, both uh, distributors as well as value-added resellers. And in the B2B tech space, it is very much in our DNA to put a lot of distribution um, management uh, controls in place via partner programs and contracts and map policies, which we've had for years at Zebra. And uh, those all served us well in terms of creating a very profitable um, and healthy channel ecosystem for our, our industry and for our, our products that we bring to market. But uh, with the emergence of e-commerce, very much in contrast with that visual you might have seen on on Whitney's team, where you saw that baker kind of standing out in front of his uh, in front of his shop. Um, you know, with the emergence of e-commerce for for us, those those distribution 
and channel management controls really weren't uh, fitting the bill for us any longer. And so very similar to uh, Yogi and some of the other case studies that Whitney was referencing earlier, you know, we, we found with the emergency of these uh, marketplaces that um, you know, we were, weren't selling through Amazon directly at all. We were not a, a 1P uh, sort of distribution structure on Amazon, but what we found that was that there were a number of third-party sellers on marketplaces that we were just not familiar with. So we have been accustomed for years to have a lot of different channel partners representing our products out into the marketplace, but some of the ones that were emerging on Amazon, uh, we have never heard from before. So um, similar to what Robin overviewed in her section of uh, the presentation, we had not just uh, product quality issues, but also uh, listing issues. So those listing is you know, listings were not aligned to our brand. Um, in some cases, they were misleading. We sell technical products. Um, so the full um, information that is necessary for a buyer to make a purchasing decision were not there in order to help that customer make that informed um, purchase decision. Um, so we had some, some real issues in that regard as well, uh, not really being certain whether the product that the customer was buying was the product that they assumed that they were receiving. So we did have some um, quality issues that we saw emerging through um, through customer um, comments and in, in the different uh, sellers that were selling on our behalf. And uh, Zebra has been long known as a quality brand from a technology product perspective. So that was alarming to us as we turned to this and, and really started to see some of the issues that were emerging. And very similar to what Whitney and Robin just described, uh, of course, we were seeing pricing issues as well. Um, putting ma you know, channel management structures in place to try to manage that over time had helped. But with the emergence of marketplaces, this was really putting pressure on our traditional channel partners that we needed to invest in our technology to continue to bring those technology solutions out to our customers. So those were some of the issues that we were facing. Very similar to what uh, had been overviewed previously, but um, very unique and, and, and different for us as a B2B technology company. So what I'll emphasize here is much less on our solution because our solution looked, looks and looked very similar to what uh, Whitney had evangelized through what Boris E-Control brings to the market and what Yogi T had adopted. So we took a very similar approach, but what I wanted to um, highlight here is the importance of internal stakeholdering and change management as it relates to uh, really bringing the organization along to some of the solutions that have been highlighted. So for our journey, we really uh, started to look out into the marketplace uh, to various experts that could help us. And, and we found some of those prior to finding uh, Voris. Um, and uh, we were reading uh, you know, thought pieces, we were reading books, we were just trying to find out anything and everything we could to really understand how the Amazon marketplace and other marketplaces work, because it was very mysterious to us, other than um, you know, getting a couple of inquiries from Amazon itself to sell our products on their marketplaces, which we did not pursue at the time. It just it seemed too risky for us, and it just wasn't the right decision. So we really uh, spent some uh, some time, I'd say probably three to four months, just getting our arms around how this all works. It was just it was very very confusing and and perplexing to us. And and in that journey, um, I really spent time focusing on the internal stakeholders I knew needed to be brought along with me as we learned. And I positioned it internally to start, really around um, you know let's let's sit together, let's work with experts and really figure this out. How does it work and what are our options? And really brought them gently into the process versus sort of, you know, coming up with a solution and presenting to, it to them cold. They were able to learn with me and were really able to, um, to explore the business problem and the possible options that we had at our disposal in order to tackle this effectively. So when I say exploration as stakeholdering, I kind of combined those two activities together. Um, we, it was kind of easy for us to bring our channel sales uh, organization along with us, and those are the folks that manage our channel partners. 
because for the most part, our channel partners were complaining about the phenomenon of e-commerce and Amazon in particular, um, and not as uh, eager to go and sell on the marketplaces themselves. But we did have some channel partners who did, and started to create a business for themselves in this regard. So as we started to explore some of the options that we had available to us and started to go down the path, very similarly to what Yogi T went down in terms of really getting control on the marketplaces it's themselves. You know, we had to bring some of those channel salespeople along in that journey as well because they were going to have to, you know, really bring some bad news to some of our channel partners uh, uh, who were not going to be receiving authorization from us to sell any longer. So bringing those folks along in the process and evangelizing to Robin's point, how this would be better for the overall channel ecosystem at large and the benefits that we would bring not just to that ecosystem, but also to the channel sales people who are having to manage people who are complaining about it as well as trying to benefit it from it at the same time was really helpful to our process. We were also though able to bring our marketing leadership team along in the journey as well. So we're trying to amass a, coal a coalition internally to, to, to really build the business case around this. So once we were able to show them the condition of our listings and the way in which our brand was represented online, we were able to bring them along in the direction of, of wanting to do something about this. And uh, we did the same thing with our product management team. So we have product management that's divided um, into various groups within our organization because we sell a number of different types of technology products. Um, and so, um, you know, Yogi may be uh, organized the same way, I'm not sure, but, you know, um, at Zebra, we've got a, a variety of different types of technology products with different PNL and different folks that we had to bring along on this journey as well. So that, that was a helpful process for us. From a legal standpoint, um, you know, we have great attorneys internally at Zebra, but none of them really were, were uh, well-versed on some of the things that uh, Voris is well-versed on since they built the practice in this area. So we had to bring them along in the process to ensure that they were comfortable with the, the, the legal options that we were pursuing and that they felt that it was in line with, uh, with um, you know, the right legal strategy for Zebra. As we were exploring different ways in which to get control um, on Amazon, I did have to work with our supply chain organization because for two reasons. One, we were at one point exploring selling you know, directly on Amazon ourselves versus leveraging a single partner on the marketplace. And so we had to go through that process of figuring out whether or not we had the competency internally at Zebra to know how to work on the Amazon marketplace directly, to know all of the you know, operational nuances of that. We ended up not going down that path, but that was an option that we had to explore as we were building the business case. And so all of this work together did a couple of things, as I've mentioned. One is to bring people along on the journey. That is huge. We just didn't sort of drop a recommendation in anybody's lap, we sort of worked together internally to come up with that recommendation. And, and as I mentioned, we, we did um, bring forward the recommendation to pursue a very similar strategy as to what, to what Yogi T has, uh, has employed. Um, after we were able to build the business case, we really had to spend a lot of time on change management. So for many of you folks out there, I'm sure you work in organizations where you, you may get folks aligned on a, a particular direction, but as they think about it, they might uh, second guess really the, the direction that you might want to go before it's finally implemented. And so we wanted to make sure we were continually uh, driving that change management throughout the organization. So we spent a lot of time on communications planning. We actually worked with the Voris team to help us uh, with content and material production that would help not just um, uh, this from a, a marketing perspective, but also um, from a sales perspective and from a channel perspective. But we worked with our marketing and our legal teams, both uh, internally, as I mentioned, and then with Voris to come up with that content and that material production. And then we had to put a series of communications and, and training uh, events uh, in place not just for our executive staff, which we had to do as well. Uh, we were upcoming onto a, a channel partner summit, which is a, uh, a meeting of our top channel partners. We do that 
virtually every year in some form or fashion. And we wanted to make sure that as we moved uh, into that event, that our executive staff was well prepared for any questions they might receive from channel partners and to ensure that we were all singing from the same song sheet. Uh, we did that also with product management. So there were some product uh, management organizations where their products were more ripe for e-commerce and others that were not. So we wanted to make sure that we were clearly communicating to all of them what our strategy was and uh, ensuring that those people who didn't feel that their products were right for marketplaces uh, were assured that we were not pursuing that path with their products. But for those that we were moving forward with, making sure we had tight alignment there. We had to make sure our channel account managers who manage our partners and our distributors were well trained on our approach and the rationale behind it and why it was a win-win for everybody. And we also had to go directly out to distributors and partners. And the partners that we focused on were what we call white glove partners, those partners who had previously set up shop on marketplaces to explain to them um, that we were pursuing a different path and that wasn't the path that we were going to be pursuing and that they were no longer authorized to sell on marketplaces. So we had a multi-pronged approach that was fairly complex, but it was critically important for us to ensure that we were able to get this off the ground. So, you know, I would say that you know, our key learnings were that executive sponsorship and that internal cross-functional sales effort is really critical. Um, for me, I had to personally understand the legal nuances of this approach for internal education purposes. So while our legal team came along with us on the journey, I was oftentimes sort of on my own to be able to uh, explain to folks why we were doing what we were doing and, um, and, and the, the legal approach that we were taking. We needed that change management effort and it is a continuous uh, learning journey for, for me and others on the team that are now involved in this. Just as Whitney mentioned, uh, this is a fast paced, ever changing sort of e-commerce world. And uh, while uh, Amazon is sort of in the lead in North America, um, we are looking to expand uh, uh, similar approaches where we can internationally and it just it's a whole new game of players when when you get out of the North America region. So I encourage you to educate yourself about the options that are available to you given your unique business situation. As Whitney mentioned earlier, not every approach works for everybody. So it's important for you to understand, of course, your business and how this will apply and, and in what way it, it should apply uh, to get you the best results. But there are resources available to you. The Voris team was a great help to us in terms of getting our arms around this and really understanding how it all works. And just know that there's a, a way to arm yourself with a strategy that really meets your business needs. So there's a way, there's a way to tackle this. It, it's, uh, it, the journey might be longer for some than others, but it's definitely well worth it in the end. So with that, I'll uh, I'll turn it back to uh, to Whitney or to uh, to Robert. Robert, I think I think this concludes the webinar. I know we're a little over time right now, um, so I, I I don't know Robert at Edge if you want to close it down. But I think from 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 Boris and Robert and Denise, um, you know we have here on the the last slide, um, our email addresses. So if anybody has questions or uh, would want to reach out to, to any of us just to, to get thoughts, feel, feel free to do so. Um, I, I, you know, we work with lots of brands and, and I, I have been just so impressed with Denise and Robin and just their 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 knowledge and capabilities of, of, of on all these issues. So I think they're they're great resources for for people just to to bounce ideas off of. And so, um, but I think I think on our end, thank you very much, and um, we'll uh, we'll see you, see you soon. Absolutely. And Whitney, Denise, and Robin, thanks so much uh, for your time today, as well as for everybody uh, who joined uh, today's call. We hope you found today's session uh, very beneficial. Uh, a number of people have asked uh, through chat that uh, if you will receive the copy of the recording and presentation. Uh, yes, you will. We will make sure to send that to you, both the presentation deck and the presentation recording. 
uh, from today. So please look out uh, from us on that. Um, as Whitney said, uh, please feel free to uh, to contact Whitney, Denise, or Robin um, with their emails uh, listed. And uh, if you'd like to get in touch with uh, with Edge by Essential on how we can help you uh, really navigate and uh, and really battle through this um, really cloudy and unpredictable retail landscape that we're currently facing, uh, please absolutely reach out to us. You can contact us at info at essentialedge.com. Uh, or you can visit us on our website at essentialedge.com and there's a contact us form there and uh, we will make sure to get back to you that way as well. Uh, so once again, want to thank uh, Whitney, Denise and Robin for their time and again for everybody joining and uh, we look forward uh, to uh, hearing back from everybody and uh, thank you everybody for your time and hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.